Okay. Uh, the first sheet I gave out to you has to do with Yud Beis Yud Gimel Tamos. It's from the first Sikha. It's printed in the Kuti Sikhas in English. And therefore, it's probably the first Sikha that was brought out in the Kuti Sikhas in Yiddish. And so they translated it first and they put it in that first volume. The interesting thing about this Sikha is what makes it especially interesting for our purposes is that the story of Yud Beis and Yud Gimotamus revolves around children because the Friediger Rebbe was arrested mainly, not just because he was a rabbi, which was enough reason for them to kill somebody. And not just because he was teaching, which was a reason enough. And not just because he was urging people and getting them to build mikvahs and when, when mikvahs were being closed, you know, like the shul of Levi Yitzchak, Rebbe's father, was turned into a warehouse. And when they fled, when they had to flee, the Re Rebbe Sinchana took the manuscripts of her husband, that he had, things that he had written, and buried them in the backyard so, and sealed them so they wouldn't be ruined by the weather and circumstances. Then what happened? They took the shul and turned it into a warehouse and cemented over the yard so you can't get them. So underneath the cement are all these extraordinary manuscripts of Rebbe Levi Yitzchuk. But for these were not, this is not why the Rebbe was in, in, put in prison and tortured and beaten and everything. It was for something, a much bigger crime than that, than any of these. And that was teaching little children. So they should play with balloons and wrap them on their arms. Look, because, I like that story, but I like the one where, I forget, was it the son of Sadek that wanted to wrap to fill in so he used potatoes? Yeah, that's Potato pills. Too. Because yeah, potato pills, fine, they, when you peel a potato, You've yeah. got to fill in. The skill that peeling it in one piece. If you have to do one piece, apples are also good. But the thing about potatoes, is you can paint them black. I don't know. The potatoes is my favorite because the rebellion are correct. Potatoes are a superior food. Yes. And they're and not so good. And it's probably what they had access to. Yeah. And it was because of this that he had, he sent out boys to pretend to be uncles of a group of youngsters and would send them to a place where nobody knew them and, uh, and they would teach them Torah. And, and these boys would come up at the eight bar mitzvah age and be able to read their prayers and to read from the Torah. And this was impossible if children were receiving no education. So it was clear that they were receiving education and the, the police who were very good at their job tracked them all down and overnight arrested, I don't know how many, maybe 150, maybe 200. From this network of underground yeshivas all over the place. And for that, he was arrested and you know the story of, Yud, of Gimel Thomas, not that they wanted to murder him, heaven forbid. And then the la at the last minute on Gimel Thomas, his sentence was commuted. And he was uh, supposed to go to Siberia for 10 years, hard labor, which he never would have survived. Nobody survived. <clears throat> I'm doing a story about si Siberia now. So I went online to get some visual references for the artist to work from. And it's daunting to see what they had to do. Rough terrain. Uh, they had to fit with a shovel, just with shovels, level the, the terrain and, and make a road 
and a railway. A person writes there that the temperatures at night were 60 below zero. They had no clothes, like a pair of pajamas, their prison clothes, no, no shelter. They're given a tent with holes in it. Very little food to begin with. And if you didn't work hard, you got none. And the guy writes there, it took 20 to 30 days for an, a new person to, to be a total wreck. That was his loss, a total wreck. Could no longer function. And then they would die. And there were hundreds of thousands. Stalin Yamakshmai sent so many people to their death. And that was the fate, going to be the fate of the out of the Friedrich Rebbe. And then that was crossed out. Now it's commuted to, to three years in a city of exile called Kostroma. And he had to pay his own ticket to go there. And that was commuted to two weeks. That was after two weeks, he was told that he could leave. And he came. He would have to pay for his own train trip back. And he said, when does the train arrive? They said, it arrives on Saturday. He said that I'm not going. Now, according to the Torah Jewish law, he could have gone because his life was in danger. Every second they could kill him just like that. He said, I'm not going. Because he knew they wanted that he should desecrate the Sabbath, even though it wouldn't be desecration because when your life is in danger, you're allowed to, to break Shabbos in order to keep many Shabbos. But if this was a matter of principle and a, and a question of who's going to win. And therefore, he didn't bend. Because of that, you have all these families, thousands of families from Russia who keep Shabbos today. So the whole trial of the previous Rebbe had to do with his edu educating children. So therefore the Rebbe picked up on this topic and he, and, and he spoke about what the different rebellion taught children. It's very interesting to compare the lessons that the Rebbeim taught and what the Rebbe said to children at rallies. Our Rebbe, what our Rebbe said to children, it's the same thing, it's all the same thing. It's all at one continuation. So he starts off with the Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tov, with his story. When Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tov, he was born into great poverty, tremendous poverty. His father was a mystic, a makubal, hidden. He excelled in the mitzvah of Abbas Yisrael, and especially in Abbas Yisrael, Hachnosis Archiv, having guests for Shabbos. And he used to send out messengers to find guests for Shabbos. It says he didn't really have a house. One version is, when the Bashem was born, he was born in a ditch. They were living in a ditch. They must have made some kind of shelter for themselves. The, he, Rabbi Eliezer was elderly. And he, he, I guess he had very poor people who would come. Someone's you. Someone's you. Rabbi Papa. 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 Yeah. Okay. So the story is that well, the story goes back even further. Okay, maybe I shouldn't tell you the story. I should just tell you. I'll jump to the to the end because it's a long story. One of the guests one time came as a, 
a very, in a very most, in a most disrespectful manner, breaking Shabbos and showing no respect for Shabbos. He, he, he came in soaking wet, carrying things on Shabbos, a knapsack and a stick, soaking wet. It's Rabbi Eliezer. Everybody else was offended by his, by him, uh, his manner. Rabbi Eliezer welcomed him and uh, made him comfortable. When Eliezer left the room, he just threw down the wine without making Kiddush. Everyone was angry at him. When Eli, Rabbi Eliezer saw people were being angry, were speaking angrily to him. He calmed them down and he spoke only nicely to him. And even though his behavior continued to be obnoxious the whole Shabbos, Rabbi Eliezer paid no attention and didn't allow anybody to, uh, uh, to be unkind to him. And when he left, the next morning, Sunday morning, Rabbi Eliezer gave him money for his trip, wherever he was going, for his journeys, and accompanied him out of town, being the, doing the midst of accompanying a person when he goes on a trip. That's why we always see a person out. We don't see a person out. It's just like giving a message, like we're happy to see them go. And it's a mitzvah to accompany them at least a few steps. Well, he accompanied him even more than a few steps. And at that point, this obnoxious beggar revealed to himself that he was really Eliyahu Anavi, who was Elijah the prophet. And there was a special neshama that had to come into the world, a very, very special neshama. And the Yetzirah in heaven had protested vehemently because he says, if this neshama comes into the world, I'm finished. It's going to be the end of me. And, and who, is, who is worthy of hosting this neshama into his family? And they said, Rebbe Eliezer is worthy. Well, the HR says, I don't know if he's so worthy. I'll go test him. He said, no, 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 no. That's that wouldn't be the 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 that wouldn't be fair, because who can stand up against you in a test? He says, so who are you going to send if not me to test him? He says, so we'll send Eliyahu and Novi. So Eliyahu and Novi was sent to test Rabbi Eliezer, and now he's escorting him out of the city. He says, I have news for you. You always wanted to have a child. You're going to be blessed with a child, and he's going to light up the eyes of all Israel, and therefore. He is called by the name Yisroel. Rabbi Eliezer, I told you, was elderly. When he was five years old, when the Baal Shem Tov was five years old, Rabbi Eliezer was ill and he was about to leave the world. According to a different version of the story, he was only three years old and he called over his young son, who was soon to become an orphan and said to him, my darling son, I want you to plant it into your mind and your heart that you should have a total love of every single Jewish person, no matter who he is, no matter where he's holding in his life, good or bad. He has a holy neshama, which is a part of God. And you, 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 your Nisham is also a holy part of Hashem. So you have to love him just like yourself. And you have to not be afraid anything, anything except Hashem. And he passed away. These were his last words to the Baal Shem Tov. To love every Jew with a total love and to be afraid only of Hashem. And the Baal Shem Tov never forgot those words. I'm sure most of you don't remember any words that were told to you when you were three years old or even five years old, but he never forgot those words. And they became the basis of all his teachings of Hasidism. The Baal boiled down to that. Abbas Yisrael and Yiras Hashem, fear of Hashem. That's what it's all about, girls. That's what it's all about. These two ideas were his 
guiding light in life, and they have to be our guiding light as well because we want to go in his footsteps. It's not always easy because you meet people who are gonna get on your nerves and gonna be annoying. And even those are people who are intimate with you. Well, people who aren't intimate with you, just people who look obnoxious, they look like not the kind of people you want to associate with as other Boston associates, you have to love them like yourself. There's a story about the Rebbe Shmuel, Rebbe Maharash, that a, a person came to him, one of his Hasidim, and he, to, he was surprised when the Rebbe asked him about a certain individual in his community. And he said, ah, don't even ask. The Rebbe said, why shouldn't I ask? He said, because he's, he's in a bad way. He doesn't associate with us anymore. He doesn't come to Shiorim. He doesn't come to Ferbrengen's. He said, do you invite him? He says, no. He said, why? He says, he wouldn't come. He's totally disassociated himself from all of us. Rebbe Maharaj said, this is not the way. You have to reassociate, reconnect with him and invite him to your gatherings and invite him to come to you for Shabbos and invite him to come to Shul. And even if he refuses, the fact that you're reaching out to him will have an effect. And if he, if he breaks halacha, or let's say breaks Shabbos 10 times every Shabbos, but because you're friendly to him, he might break, the, break Shabbos only nine times. That's already worth, you have no idea how precious that is to Hashem. And it's worth more than all of the mitzvahs that somebody else will do. That's obviously so in action. Okay, that's what the Baal Shem Tov was told by his father. And these are the underpinnings of the Hasidic movement. So they're very important ideas to us today. They, they're not limited by time and space. A child could ask a question though, on these teachings and say, listen, it's very nice to say, don't be afraid of anything, but I am afraid. When I walk through certain parts of New York, I'm afraid. When I come into a new school and I don't know anybody there, I'm afraid. When I'm surrounded by bullies in my class or from other classes, I'm, I'm afraid. How am I supposed to deal with this? So the main student of the Baal Shem Tov was Rabbi Dovber, the Magad of Mezrich, and he gives us an answer, a very interesting answer. He said, when a man has a child, and the man could be a rocket scientist, he could be a genius, he could be an artist, he could be a writer, he could be a big businessman, he could be a working man with a lot of life experience, whatever he is. Certainly he has much knowledge. Either he learned it in books or he learned it in his, from his doings, or he learned it from the hard knocks of life, but he has a lot of knowledge that this child doesn't have. But he doesn't behave like a knowledgeable grown-up because he loves the child. So what does he do? Should we ask Malka Levana, what do you do, Malka Levana, with a little child? Well, when the child wraps balloons around his arm, what do you do? You just tell them it's so cute. You, 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 more than that, you, if he has a little toy that he likes to play with, a little truck or a little locomotive or a car, you get on the floor and you play with the car with the child. I was babysitting and someone asked for money, so I gave my little kid a dollar bill. I'm like, okay, Isaac, you go and give Sadaka. Yeah. And precious. And if you gave him a nickel, would have been, been made a difference? I mean, no, but I only had a dollar bill. So <laughs> it would have made a difference because I didn't have it. So like Listen, dear, could you book. get me a refill oh, on this, of please? Of course. Um, so the, the, he says the, the, the grown-up gets down on the floor and plays with the child. 
This is a tremendous lesson because the grown-up represents Hashem and the child is a Jewish person. And Hashem, in his essence and his glory, gets down on our level and gives us mitzvahs, which is to him is like the father playing with toys. But he does that so the child will know that the father loves him. Did you hear that? The father represents Hashem, and the child is a Jewish person. And the father gets down on the floor. It's like Hashem lowers himself into the world of Gashmias, of physical things, and gives these little things, these toys, to the child, which are mitzvahs. And, and these are his mitzvahs. He does them, and he gives them to us so that we can have a connection with him, a relationship with him, that the child will have a relationship with his father and he'll know that his father loves him. And the lesson we have to take from that is we have to know, A, the mitzvahs are gifts that Hashem is giving to us. They're his personal gifts, like getting a dollar from the Rebbe. Does the, does the Rebbe need to stand there for four or five, six, seven hours and give dollars? And what is a dollar after all anyway, a piece of paper? But, it, but we, those dollars are precious to us because they're from the Rebbe and we know they come with a bracha, which is a bracha that he gives us with love because otherwise why would he stand there? Which was difficult for him or for anybody. Now imagine someone like in his 90s doing this. Because this is what Hashem does. Hashem comes down to our level and gives us mitzvahs. And if we don't keep them, he finds ways to send people to teach us to keep them and to encourage us to keep them. And if we're, kids are brought up in from homes and they, 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 they put on tefillin at their bar mitzvah and they get disillusioned and they don't know how to keep, they don't know what it's all about. And they're bored to death on Shams. And they, in a previous generation, it would take a lot of guts to go to Manhattan and watch a movie. Nowadays, you just go to your room and watch a movie on your phone. And they're not keeping Shabbos. This is very painful to the father or the child doesn't want to play with the truck with him. Because the Shabbos is the most precious gift that Hashem gives us. And he is in the Shabbos. You're keeping a Shabbos, you're, you're with Hashem. It's Hashem Shabbos. You're keeping a Shabbos with Hashem. And the kid doesn't want. So what happens? Hashem doesn't just throw his hands up in the air. He sends a shliach. And the shliach invites the, the guy to come for Shabbos. He says, I don't want to come for Shabbos. He says, well, come over for the meal. So he comes for the meal, and the, and the, the shliach has children. And the, the, guy, the student gets on the floor and plays with the children. In the meantime, he keeps Shabbos. There was a guy who used to come to the ring in 770 on Shabbos, and he would drive to 770. He would drive, and the Rebbe would honor him and sit him down at the table with him. And the Hasidim were aghast, horrified. Why is the Rebbe being nice to this guy who drives over on Shabbos? Why doesn't the Rebbe tell him to keep Shabbos? But the Rebbe was only nice to him, like the Rebbe Maharaj said, be nice to him. The fact that he's coming and sitting with you for a few hours on Shabbos, that's better than going to the baseball game or the football game, or the golf club, or the card club, the country club. So the Rebbe let him come and spend Shabbos with him. Shabbos after Shabbos after Shabbos. One time he used to go over to the Rebbe to say goodbye because he was leaving, or else the Rebbe called him over. I don't know exactly how it happened. The Rebbe called him over, said, you're leaving now? He said, yeah. I imagine he said, yes. The Rebbe said, I want the keys to your car. I would like you to give me the keys to your car. 
He just reached in his pocket, put the keys on the table. <laughs> the Rebbe was so nice to him. He, how could he refuse? So he kept Shabbos. And the next week he passed away. So they made sure he kept Shabbos before he left the world. I'm going to interject here another story. I'm running out of time already. This is one of my favorite stories. Malka Levana, you know the story. No, no, no. And it's about Mike's Hats. There used to be a hat store in Kingston Avenue called Mike's. The owner was Mike. Crown Heights was a community made up of Reform and conservative Jews, mainly Reform, or non-affiliated altogether, not religious. And this was after the Second World War when Jews were afraid to be seen as Jews. Even Hasidim, even Jews in Hasidic families were afraid to go around with their tzitzis out. When I came to Toronto, when I first started keeping Shabbos, I came to Toronto and I met the, 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 the leaders of the community, not the rabbis, a leader of the community. And I was shocked. I said, why? How come you don't wear your tzitzis out? You're a chabad, chazit, chazit. I couldn't understand it. So that was the community, you see. So Mike, there was this guy, Mike, had a hat store. He was not a religious person. The Rebbe's mother lived at the corner of President in Kingston. And every day, the Rebbe would go to visit her. Every day. Every day. Before he went home to see his wife, he would go to see his mother. And as he walked up Kingston Avenue, he would tip his hat as he passed by Mike. Every day. And Mike noticed this one time. You don't notice it twice, three times, four times, five times. You start to notice it. You start to notice it. Then he was wondering, does the Rebbe do this to everybody or he just does this to me? So he looked. He was only doing it to him. How come? Why does the rabbi tip his hat to me and not to anybody else? Could it be he's trying to tell me something? Wonder what he's trying to tell me. I have a hat store. Maybe he's telling me I should wear a hat. Nah. <laughs> Maybe. Nah. Wonder if he is. So the next day, he decided to make a test. Took a hat. He had all kinds of hats. He took a hat. He put it on. And the Rebbe walked by, looked in the store, and didn't go like that. He was right. <laughs> the Rebbe was trying to tell him something. Oh, he wasn't like, like some red hot bucker would go into the store and say, what's wrong with you? You're a hat store. Why don't you wear a hat? Why don't you wear a yarmulke? He didn't say anything. Just tip, let him figure it out by himself. Just tip this hat at the time of him. He was so impressed with the sensitivity of the Rebbe. He, he, he couldn't get over it because he felt the love that the Rebbe had for him. The Rebbe didn't want to embarrass him or pressure him. And he let him get the message by himself. He, 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 he couldn't get used to it. He just couldn't get used to it. And he's thinking about it the whole time. He says, I really want to meet this rabbi. It's a reformed Jew. He doesn't go to shul. Maybe on Yom Kippur, he might, might go to synagogue for an hour. Maybe he might not even fast. I remember one year my father called me, all of us home. He says, you know, I didn't go to shul on Yom Kippur this year. I said, you know why? I said, no, why? He says, because I can't hear the rabbi anyway. I just fall asleep. So I stayed home. 
And I took out a prayer book and I read a prayer. I cried. He said, And I spoke to Hashem, I spoke to God, and I asked them to take care of all you kids, take care of mommy. It was meaningful. So this is this kind of a guy. He said, I got to meet this rabbi. I never met any rabbi like that. My rabbi, my rabbi gives sermons. So he, one day he picked them away. Screwed his courage up. He went to 770. He sees all these Hasidim, beards and hats, black jackets. He says, how do I meet the rabbi? He says, well, to meet the rabbi, we, we could arrange it. This is the early years. We could, we'll see if the rabbi is available. And then when the secretary knocked on the door, could you see the, this gentleman here from Mike's hats? I was such sentiment. So he comes and he stands in front of the Rebbe's desk. The Rebbe is standing up. The Rebbe says, can I help you? Is there anything you, you would like? He says, no, Rabbi, there's nothing I like, nothing I, I, I would like, or nothing I would need. I just wanted to meet you. He says, can I do anything for you? He says, well, I really would just like to give you a hug. <laughs> now, Shluchim, they always tell when they bring someone, they say, Don't shake hands with the rabbi and don't sit down. You know, he said, I want to give you a hug. It's not protocol. It says, When you touch the, rab the rabbi, you, it's like you're pushing the holy, the, the shechina away. Don't touch the rabbi. I want to give you a hug. What did the rabbi do? The rabbi didn't say, You don't hug a rabbi. The Rebbe walked up from behind his desk and stood in front of the desk. So now he's standing in front of the desk. He's standing in front of the desk. And Mike is standing in front of the desk. They're just standing there. And Mike realizes what's going on. And he opens up his <laughs> and he gives the Rebbe a hug. And the Rebbe hugs him back. And that's how, that's what it means to love. That's what Rabbi Eliezer said to his little son. You have to love a child of another person, no matter who he is, no where he is. And, and so this is, the Magad says, this marshal of the father with the child, that's what the relationship was like with the Rebbe. It's like the father with the child. And if the child knows that the father loves him that much that he's going to be on the floor and play with him. So Hashem is the father. Hashem is always with him. Hashem is always with him. You know what that means, girls? Hashem is always with you. That means whoever you meet when you leave this class now, it's who Hashem wants you to meet. Whoever you're going to see in the store or the subway, or you're going to drive home, or you're going to meet someone or a roommate, Whoever it is, that's exactly who Hashem wants you to meet at that moment. You're not alone. Hashem is with you. And he wants you to display the same feeling to this person that Hashem has for you. And then a child will never be afraid. And that answers the question, how can I, a little child, Go around and not when in such a big world. I'm just a little child in a big, huge world with all kinds of people, powerful people, rich people, uh, dangerous people. How can I not be afraid? Because if you know Hashem is with you, you never, you never have to be afraid of anything. Anything. That was what the market, the foremost disciple and student of the Ms. Rabbi Shalom Baal Shem Tov taught. And then the Rebbe spoke about the Rebbe Maharash. The Rebbe Maharash, the Rebbe Shmuel, 
when the Rebbe Shmuel was very young, I know when the children of the Rebbe Maharaj were young, he used to say to them that they have to set a goal for themselves in life. Now, if I would ask you, do you have a goal for yourself in life? Hmm, maybe yes. Maybe you want to be a ballerina. Yeah. Maybe you want to be a doctor or a dentist or a lawyer or a housewife or a mother. Or a psychologist who can help people. I'll tell you a story about someone who got that answer. Went, okay, I'll tell you in a second. Well, what did the Reverend Maharaj say to his children? He said, you have to have a goal in life. And your goal in life should be to live according to what Hashem wants. That's a big goal. Because yeah, it means you're going to have to learn what Hashem wants. And you have to learn it and live it. And live it. And when you live it, you're doing mitzvahs. And this is an important thing I just learned today. There's a video of a young man. They made this video, it's one of the gem videos, and they've been showing it in the museum over and over and over and over again. And he was uh, taking drugs in college. And he had yeshivas, he became this guy who went through his shliya, and he was went to yeshiva, and he asked the Rebbe about taking drugs because it gives you a spiritual experience. The Rebbe answered him that it doesn't last. It's an experience that doesn't last. And then the Rebbe wrote him a whole long letter. And just as I was leaving the museum today, I started playing this video again, and they got to the point where he reads this letter from the Rebbe. And the Rebbe says something in the letter that's really, really extraordinary. He says that we have to know that when we do mitzvahs, mitzvahs in them for themselves are important. They're very valuable. They're very deep. In and for themselves, they're, they're good. But, you know, we don't always appreciate it. Sometimes we could appreciate it. When you know that shop is candle, you can appreciate it. It's how beautiful. But when you give a beggar on the street a quarter, you don't know that you did it. A lot of mitzvahs you do, you don't feel anything for them. You don't realize that you're doing something godly. But the Rebbe says there that we have to know that when we do the mitzvahs, even though we don't feel what, they, what we're really doing, they are the channels, the conduits to, for Hashem's blessings that they should come into the world from Hashem who is infinite. And with that way, we bring the infinite into the world. But the mitzvahs themselves are channels for blessings. That's a point that is not, not stressed. It's not brought out very often. Okay, so that's what the Rebbe Maharaj said, that we should set our goal that we're going to live, everything we do will be according to what Hashem wants. Not pick and choose. And even though we can't do everything all at once, but so little by little, we'll, 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 we'll work on it. We'll work on it and we know that we've got more to go and we'll keep on working on it. And what we do, we'll keep on trying to do it better and better and better and better and there's no end. There's no end to better, right, real time? Well, good is good, better is better. What? If good is good, then better is better. Better is better, right. And when the, the Rebbe, the previous Rebbe was a child, only four years old. Now, this was his, Yud Beis Tammuz, Yud Gimel Tammuz. We're now in these days when the Rebbe said we should forbring about it. This Chag Ha'geula, this is a period of Rebbe redemption. And since it's the redemption of the previous Rebbe, it's a redemption for everybody who's connected with him. And he said, it's not just a redemption for me, it's a redemption for the Torah itself because I was only punished and, and put in prison because of Torah. So if I was redeemed, the Torah was redeemed. And we understand the Torah was redeemed because when he was freed, that meant that all the students who were carrying on his work would carry on his work even more. So all the people who benefited from the the, the children that he the the, the the Hasidim that he sent out to teach others, including ourselves, including this place. 
By the way, today is, tonight, tomorrow is the birthday of Rabbi Gansberg, who was the, Rabbi Gansberg, the husband of Mrs. Gansberg. Last week was her yard site, was her birthday. Last week was her birthday. And we made, we mentioned the whole thing about birthdays last week because of her. So this is his birthday, her husband. So he, the previous Rebbe, when he was a child, what set him up on this path of de dedicated, he dedicated his life literally, literally, they wanted to take his life because he dedicated it to teaching children. And when he was four years old, his father said to him, uh, his father was one of those children that his father said to him, you have to have a goal in life. Your goal in life has to be to do what Hashem wants, to live like Hashem wants. So his son was Rabbi Dovber. Rabbi Dovber was the father of the, our of the previous Rabbi. And he said to him, do you know why Hashem gave us two eyes? Why do we have two eyes? Wouldn't one eye be enough? So he said, because, are you with me, Devorah, in Brazil? Yes. Yes, yes Rabbi, I am. Eyes. Thank you so much. Sora and Debbie, why do we have two eyes? So the Rebbe, Rashab, Shalom Dover said to his son, the, he said to his son, Rabbi Yezid Yitzchak, the previous Rebbe, of our, the, the, the leader of our generation, the prophet of our generation, the Moshiach of our generation. He said, you have two eyes so that you should have a right eye for another Jew to look for his good qualities. And when you see his good qualities, to try and imitate them and make them your own. And you should have a left eye for candies and toys that you don't need. These are things you don't need. They're nice. Every, every kid likes candies and every kid likes toys, but you, you don't need them. So you should look at them with a the left eye. It's, it's okay, nice, but you know, I'm not gonna, it's not gonna be the end of the world if I don't have it. But the right eye is to look on another person with a right eye, with a to look for their good, the goodness that's in them. So though we have four, four lessons we just discussed, <clears throat> the Baal Shem Tov, what he learned from his father, to love every Jew and to be only afraid of Hashem. And the Magad, with the story, how can I not be afraid of anybody but Hashem? Because you have to remember that Hashem is like a father down on the floor playing with us, his beloved children, because he wants, the father wants to lift up the child and, and, and tell him, and express his love to him. And how does the father express his love to the child? He hugs him, he kisses him. He speaks to him, he sings to him, he makes funny noises to him. Cha -cha 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 -cha. <laughs> That's what they do, right? That's what your father did with you. I think, I hope. And that's Hashem, that's a marshal, that's all a parable of how Hashem gives us mitzvahs, which are his essence in order to lift us up, to be on his level, face to face with him. And then we have the, the lesson of the Rebbe Rashab, Rabbi Sholem Dovber, whose father told him you have to have a goal in life. No, who told his son, you have to have a goal in life. No, no, his, Rebbe told, his father told him, Rebbe Shmuel told Rebbe Sholem Dovber, the Rashab, I have to have a goal in life, which is to live like the Ebishter wants. Be a mensch. To be a mensch. To be sincere in everything you do. Everything you do should be meaningful. 
There's no such thing as killing time. And he, the Rebbe Rashab taught his son, the previous Rebbe, and our Rebbe said about the previous Rebbe that the, the Rebbe of the generation is the, the prophet of the generation, the Moshiach of the generation. So obviously he's, our Rebbe is all those things. And he says them about his father-in-law because they're him. And he said to him, why do we have two eyes that we should look on every Jew with a right eye? And the toys and the candies and the cars and the houses and the clothes and the expensive shetalach <laughs> and the cabana in Florida or in Mexico, that's all candies and toys. It's nice, you don't need it. What you do need is to have the right eye for the right thing. Thank you very much. Good yontiv, good yontiv. We should take these lessons and live with them. And if we do, then we will always be getting better and better and better. We'll be nicer people. We'll be more sensitive people. We'll be happier people. And, and our parents will be happy. And our teachers will be happy. And Hashem will be happy. <laughs> and he'll send Moshiach right away to take everybody, take the whole world out of those. Thank you very much, girls. Thank you, Ben. Thank you.